how it is. We call now the Aircraft Owners and Pilots Association, the Aviation Maintenance, Repair and Overhaul Business Association, Sport Aircraft Association of Australia and the Gliding Federation of Australia. I'll come to you a second this time, mate, after we give Glenn the call. That's right, Yeah. yeah. Hurts, yeah. <coughs> oh, it's complex because you know you don't want anything to compromise the safety yet. <laughs> All right. Welcome. I'm not going to repeat uh, my earlier opening with with respect to opening statements. I just. Each of you needs to be conscious that the more time we take with opening statement, and shouldn't limit it, but just know that it's a balancing act for us. So just before we start, and for the Hansard, starting on the right, could you please uh, state your name and the organisation that you're with? Uh, Anthony White is uh, my name. I'm, I'm Morris Tony. Uh, I'm the President of the Sport Aircraft Association of Australia and one of the founding members of uh, the, the AGAR, which is the... Um, Australian, General Australian General Aviation Alliance. Okay. And Mr Morgan. Benjamin Morgan from the Aircraft Owners and Pilots Association of Australia and we're also a member of the Australian General Aviation Alliance. Okay. Mr uh, Talbot. Richard Talbot. I'm here representing the Aircraft Maintenance Repair and Overhaul Business Association. Um, we have approximately 350 aircraft repair and overhaul businesses across Australia and I'm also the Vice President of AOPA Australia. All right. What percentage of the market's that when you say the 350 businesses? About 50 per cent. Okay. Mr Sesco? I'm Peter Sesco. I'm the President of the Gliding Federation of Australia. Uh, just so everybody understands, I'm also a member of the SAAA, who are at the other end, and I'm a member of RAOs. You're another one of those ones that go up in the sky and then get released with no motor or anything. Is that, I have so much that fun, what you Senator. Do? It's great. I'll bet it's fun. I think you should take so, it <laughs> I can close my eyes and, and uh, get a kick out of that. Senator Steele. Um, OK. Um, thanks, Chair. I think former Senator Ludwig was a glider. Or is a glider? <laughs> OK. Yeah, yeah, no, there you go. I suppose we're this, this, look, this goes on from chairs as we were... Uh, um, we, uh, ben, uh, Mr Morgan, you appeared in front of us in Sydney. We had a conversation. And I suppose it's all come about the frustration that your um, members have experienced with the two tiers. And I believe, and please, you're not doing an opening statement, but we really need to hear what's going on out there. What have been the frustrations? And, and, and I know there's been letters going backward and forward to CASA. So what we have established is your members, for, for whatever reason, are exposed to a greater a tougher regime and a more costly regime. That's correct. So if you can explain to us what's actually awesome. going on out there. OK, well, certainly. Yeah, thank you very much for the opportunity to come and speak today. Uh, we really do appreciate it. Uh, I would like to start off by saying that we are suffering uh, an environment of dual standard at this point in time, and it is <coughs> placing the CASA-regulated uh, private pilot community at a significant disadvantage to those uh, that are, have access to aviation through self-administrating uh, organisations. I would like to be on the record and clearly state that the Aircraft Owners and Pilots Association and the Australian General Aviation Alliance are entirely supportive of the industry's right of access to associations uh, and we in no manner wish to uh, <coughs> infringe or impinge upon the, the rights of the members of RAOs and other organisations. We are supportive of their purpose in the industry. But what we do, uh, what we are focused on and what we're looking at here is the need for universal, fair and equitable medical rights for all pilots regardless of the licence that they hold. <clears throat> and so under the current system, as you've heard from the presentation uh, from the RALs today, uh, their members have access to the ability to self-certify their medical fitness. They can fill out a form, they can declare to the RALs that they are fit and healthy and they can go climb in an aircraft which is exactly the same in its construction and performance to a CASA regulated VH registered aeroplane. That is, these pilots are given a far lower liberalised approach to medical certification, one in which they just tick the box and sign the form, and yet our pilots within the CASA regulated arena are being subjected to medical certification requirements uh, that are incredibly high 
and are forcing pilots out of our industry. And what do I mean by they're incredibly high? We have a situation where a pilot, in order to pass a class two medical, can be required to undertake a myriad, a plethora of additional blood work tests, sleep apnea tests, sleep deprivation tests, you name the test, they seem to be exposed to it. And these tests cost our members and cost our community enormously. I have examples uh, of members spending upwards of five and six thousand dollars to gain a private, uh, private pilot medical certification. And this is a ludicrous situation. Those same pilots where CASA declare in a form letter that they receive that says that you have become a, or you are a risk uh, to aviation safety and therefore we're declining your medical certificate, <coughs> quite often, more than not, these pilots immediately go across to the RAOs where they fill out a self-certification form and then they go flying in the RAOs. And many of them have continued to fly. Same planes. Same, in many cases, same planes. Well, uh, and these people have gone on for many years to fly successfully and in fact are not a risk to aviation safety. Mm. And so there is a dual standard. The dual standard is very real, it's very tangible and it is having an enormous negative impact on our industry. It's not just hurting private aircraft ownership and private aircraft flying, it's, it's having an impact on the aircraft maintenance community, it's having an impact on the aviation <coughs> flight training industry uh, and it's hurting the overall sustainability of the general aviation economy. Well, Mr Morgan, you must know what's on Cass's mind with this. I mean, this is a very stark uh, parity issue. You must know what's on their mind as to what their argument is with respect to your members versus the others. It would help us if you could guide us with what or, or you can declare you don't know what's on their mind. Well, well, well Senator, <coughs> the, only, the only reason that's been put on the table in front of us is that there is an argument that because <coughs> CASA regulated pilots being RPL and PPL holders will access controlled airspace, this seems to be the hanging point. And because CASA won't allow a pilot on a self, uh, well actually it's technically not correct, they state that a pilot that's on a self-assessed medical can't access CTA. Uh, they can't allow our RPL and PPL... ETA is so. what? Sorry? Control ETA? Air Sorry? CTA. CTA, controlled airspace. Controlled air space. Yeah, sorry. So, Which so is a build-up area. Correct. So, can I just jump in there, Chair? Mm. So, just help me out, please, Mr Morgan. So, is it a case that if a plane fell out of the sky in the city, is more of a concern if it fell out of a plane, if it fell out of the sky out in rural Australia. Now, Senator, it would be a concern of the fall out of the sky regardless, but uh, well, if, you had, a, if you had an environment where there was controlled airspace and uh, the person was operating an aircraft on a self-assessed medical or self-certified medical, they'd be an RAOs pilot or a glider pilot, uh, and technically they should be Can staying out of that space. Paradise, I seem to recall flying over the top of um, Bankstown and other places like that. Um, uh, out to the training grounds in, in the Western Sydney, and that, that wasn't controlled airspace. No, you have situations right across Australia where you have controlled airspace and non-controlled airspace. No, I understand. I'm just trying to differentiate. The, 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 there was some statements flying around that controlled airspace is above populated areas. I put it to you, there are many uh, uncontrolled airspaces Correct. across Sydney. Correct. So that's not a differentiator. No, no. Thanks for that. It's even more confusing. No, that, I just wanted to... Well, Senators, if I could you know. confuse you just a little bit further, I might ask that my colleague, Peter Sesco, he makes a comment about the fact that our gliding fraternity for almost 70 years have had access to CTA on self-certified medicals. Yeah, but yeah, we, we get that now. No more time needs to be spent on that, right? But you better guide us on why uh, metropolitan Sydney is broken into a patchwork quilt as to why some is controlled airspace and... Some of it is not. Is it to do with aircraft's manoeuvres? Are they approaching an airport, therefore they're in control space? Are they over Parliament House? That's because they're in control space. It's all to do with air traffic management, Senator, in terms of the design of that air traffic uh, area. Yes, so meaning that while they're in controlled airspace, something's happening. They're not just flying along at 30,000 feet and transitioning mm. across. Something's happening. They're thinking about a manoeuvre. They're in a pattern. They're going to land. Is that is that a fair assessment of it? So that yes, we can get a handle around that. Can, can I answer? <coughs> Senators, controlled airspace fundamentally is there for the protection of uh, the big passenger uh, aircraft and the smaller passenger aircraft, mm. and the fair paying public who have no understanding. They just get on a bus and they go fly with Qantas, Virgin, whomever, uh, or they get into a second tier airline, and all that airspace is there to control and make as safe as possible those aircraft and and, and we appreciate that it's like a beltway yeah. where you've got they're, they're all coming together correct and the but, only different no no you'll, you'll we'll need to guide you mr white sure. here so if i'm flying along and then suddenly a little beeper goes off and it says to me you're in controlled airspace 
I can sort of move over 100 metres and I'm out of controlled airspace, I'm still over the same superb correct. environment, is that right? Correct. That's correct. So what percentage of Greater Sydney or Melbourne, Perth, you pick one that you have experience with, would be controlled airspace versus non-controlled airspace? Well, we could work that out, Senator, but we'd have to take that on just, notice. Just to, to guide you, Chair, on. very close to Sydney Airport, controlled airspace is right on the ground. Sure. As you move slightly further away, sure. the controlled airspace goes higher and higher sure. and higher. It's like, it's like I, I know the answer to my own question because sure. I investigated accidents. Okay. Cool. So, That's right, you do. So. Uh, <laughs> so I know the answer to my own question. I'm trying to get it out so that yeah, it'll guide my colleagues in relation to the questions that they're asking. That's all. It's well, like an upside down wedding cake. Uh, effectively, the, the, the wedding cake starts at the higher level and it comes down to the, to the sure. airport. Sure. And, uh, and anything that's underneath that wedding cake steps is uh, outside controlled airspace and, and anybody can fly in that. All right, just, that just finally then, the, the, the regulations are that if you've self-assessed, you shouldn't be in controlled airspace. Full Correct. stop, that's a principle. Correct. But you're suggesting that there are people who've self-assessed that are lawfully in that space or unlawfully in the space? No. If I can talk to that and the risk associated with that, Senator, I think it's a... Well, just talk to the lawfulness of okay, it. OK, the lawfulness of it is glider pilots have been able to do that since we started in 1949, and we take that seriously. The vast majority of gliding organisations <coughs> are outside controlled airspace <coughs> because it, it makes life difficult. No, but you, you're telling us now that glider pilots have self-assessed, can go into controlled airspace, they're the only class of pilots that can do that? I, I guess self that's Self-assessed pilots? Yes. And what, why, 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 why them and not so many others? It's <clears throat> largely historical, but it's also based around uh, risk management, I, I believe. Historically, glider pilots have been able to do it. We... Um, there are three risk areas that I probably <coughs> need to mention, which would help, I, I believe. I'm not trying to take time. Sure. Um, in the British Gliding Association in 1969, did, did a 10-year study of 1.6 million flights, and they found there were four medical incidents in that. In, 19, uh, in 2016, the British CAA did a similar study, and I don't know their methodology, so but they are, this is out there. Uh, they did a, a similar study and they found a sufficient lack of risk to go to self-declaration for a private pilot's licence, uh, pilot licence holders to carry three passengers with a maximum takeoff mass of 5,200 kilos um, from that point. So that, that's recent. Uh, the Gliding Federation has flown roughly 9 million flights since 1949 and we've had, we think, Maybe, and we're not sure, there, it's a bit undefined, three medical incidents that have caused crashes and no external fatalities associated with those. Um, I think perhaps the most important one that I can, I can help you with <coughs> is I was at a CASA um, medical inquiry in 1988 or 89. I was chairman of the operations panel of the Gliding Federation. And one of the people at that, there was Qantas, ANSET, CASA or the equivalent CASA Department of Transport or something of those days. And there was us and I think the Australian Parachute Federation. And they were, uh, CASA was openly trying to get us to take on uh, CASA medicals. We were fighting it. And uh, one day we came in on the third meeting, I think, and one of the attendees stamped on the table and said, you guys have got to get CASA medicals because my mate had a CASA medical last Monday and he died from a heart attack on Wednesday. Now, he was just so emotional he didn't know what he was saying. But that was the, that's the whole point. <clears throat> sure. Medical system cannot predict heart attacks even now. So could I come back, Chair? Yes, if I may just, and I'll, be, I'll move on to everyone else gets a chance. So, in your, so clearly with, with the uh, Airline Alliance, whatever, all of you, it, it's a case that you're arguing that the self-assessment shouldn't be Available? No, is that that's, what you're that's, no, that's not correct, Senator. What we're, what we're arguing that, really is we're arguing, arguing for universal, fair and equitable access. Now, right. what we're saying in that, and I'd just like to reference a letter I received back from CASA on the 11th of uh, October, right. and that is, for nearly a year and a half, the Aircraft Owners and Pilots Association had sent a multitude of letters to CASA 
to qualify a question. And the question was, uh, was it safe for a pilot to fly an aircraft outside controlled airspace with one passenger uh, and to do so on a self-assessment medical? Now, we knew it was safe because CASA had permitted the RAOs, for example, to do exactly this. They clearly had made a determination as the safety regulator that they, it was in fact safe and therefore this organisation was approved to do it. Now the question has always been, why is one organisation approved and yet the CASA regulated pilot fraternity denied? And so I actually got a reply on the 11th of October and it was actually strange that I got the reply on the 11th of October because it came exactly 24 hours after Senator Stirl, you were quoted in the media as saying that you were seeking an inquiry into the dual standards in medicine. Well, so it's my fault for not I doing it earlier. I don't know. It's miraculous, Senator. Yeah. But the question I put forward to CASA was, quote, is it safe for an Australian private pilot to fly an Australian registered aircraft with an MTO of 600 kilograms in Australian airspace on a self-certification private driver's licence medical, meaning outside controlled airspace. The response I got from CASA a year and a half <coughs> virtually after we started this process was, quote, the answer is yes. Now, if the answer is yes, Senators, and the role of our regulator is to set aviation safety standards based on risk, and for those standards to be promulgated into regulation, why is our safety regulator denying our pilot community the choice to fly in that category? Now, we are not asking our organisations are not asking at this point in time to be granted the access to fly on an RPL licence and a PPL licence inside of controlled airspace. We have asked for the safety regulator to approve our RPL PPL <coughs> to fly outside controlled airspace with one passenger in an aircraft with an MTO of up to 600 kilograms, which is exactly mirroring what has been approved for this self-administration mm -hmm. and for that to be allowed. And yet we are being denied that facility. And uh, Senators, I have to really make the statement, and that is we are being denied our rights and we are being denied our choice. And as a consequence of, these, of this provision not being afforded to our community, we are in effect being forced to then go into the private self-administration uh, arena as pilots because we have nowhere else to go. And I come back to the statement I made earlier, and that is we seem to have a large and growing population of elderly pilots who are finding it harder to maintain their medicals. And what we know is many of these pilots get to a point that as soon as CASA starts asking for repetitive tests, tests that are expensive, they simply sell the Cessna, they sell the Piper, they sell the Mooney, they sell the Beechcraft, they get out of CASA regulated aviation and they simply go pay a fee to a private company and continue to do what they were otherwise doing within the CASA regulated general but aviation you said space. That they could, sorry, Mr White, you said that they could do it with the same planes. They can, it can be exactly the same plane, but it has a different registration. Yeah. And I think that the critical issue here is to understand that the self-certified world, uh, sorry, that the, yeah, the, the, self, the, the, the ASAO group of RAOs have been granted a special exemption uh, to fly in Australian airspace with a, uh, a numbered registration. So they have 19 dash... Uh, series of numbered aeroplanes, they have 24 dash and a series of numbered aeroplanes, uh, whereas the rest of the community, the parachute group that were on earlier, the warbirds, we all fly VH. And VH is the same insignia as your Qantas jets, uh, okay. our, everybody. So, but everybody who flies VH as a registration mark right. has to conform to the CASA system. And it was interesting to, to, to hear the difficulty to explain your question earlier from the last group who just seem to stumble over the concept that uh, you know, a VH aeroplane, as a minimum, you have to have a Class 2 or a Class 2 Basic, which was the, the latest uh, advent of uh, uh, medical by CASA, which is transport department related, or you go on to the higher classes for commercial activities where you need a Class 1 and then you need a commercial medical, ATPL, higher up, higher up, higher up. Right. Sorry, Mr. White, because yeah. I know the chair's going to pull my nose in a minute. Can I just finish on this one then? Thank you. So we go back to Mr. Morgan. You were saying you've got examples of older pilots because there's extra blood tests, and blah, blah, blah. So it come to a cost of about $5,000, which they've just decided, that's it, I'll sell that plane, get out, sure. I'll shoot across and join RAOs. Yep. And then what would, what's the average well, Senator, cost for a... I have one particular example, which I just, I fall back on all the time because it really 
typifies and highlights the lunacy Throw of the situation. Yeah. And that is, I have a member of our organisation that uh, about two years ago received a letter from CASA basically saying that he was, he was a risk to aviation safety and therefore his class two medical had been declined. Uh, he then went through the processes of appealing that. Uh, I provide an extensive amount of background support to help move that process forward. But at the moment he received the letter, I actually said to him, I'd like you to go straight out right now and register with the RAOs and go sign a self-cert medical and go conduct some training in an aircraft so that we can get you flying. So he did exactly that. And for the two years <coughs> it took to get his medical renewed, he continued to fly an RAL's aircraft every week. And you can provide the Senate with that I information? Absolutely, absolutely Senator. Thank I think you. he'd be more than happy to come here and actually speak with you. Thank you, Mr Morgan. Thank you, Chair. I'll give someone else a chance. Senator Brock. So just, just to continue on the theme, um, yeah. particularly the like for like. I mean, that's, that's Mr Morgan, that's, particularly what you're, that's essentially what you're calling for is if you've got similar sized aircraft flying similar places with a similar number of passengers, similar. you're seeking similar set of rules in terms of medical certification. Yeah. Well, Senator, again, I you know, repeat the statement. I, our, our association and I, get, I believe our AGAA partners do not understand why we have a regulator that seems intent on creating one set of rules for government CASA regulated participants and a completely different set of rules for private self-administration participants. And what we can see within the context of the medical reform process is we can see regulations that have been implemented which are clearly designed to disadvantage general aviation CASA regulated pilots. And what do I mean by that? Um, if you have a look at what the United States has done over the past two years and we look at what the United Kingdom have done over the past two years, they have successfully reformed their private pilot medical standards. Both countries recognised there was a need for wholesale change, a total liberalisation of the system and move towards private driver's licence standards. We in Australia had hope uh, had hoped that this is exactly what CASA would do because there was a clear, a clear demonstration that a private driver's licence standard was sufficient for the 10,000 members of the RAOs and the thousands of members within the gliding fraternity. And so in 2016, late 16, when the reforms were announced, we all sat back thinking, well, if the UK's done it, the US has done it, we're certainly not going to be different because, let's face it, the air is not different here in Australia. It's exactly the same as it is in the United States and it is in the UK. Yet much to our surprise, the reforms that CASA delivered for us in general aviation was they implemented a basic class two environment that now required pilots to pass a commercial truck driver's medical. But more importantly, they made that medical a requirement you had to pass it unconditionally. Now it's the unconditional part that really creates the herring in, in this particular situation in that there are substantially a great number of general aviation pilots that will pass a commercial truck driver's medical. In fact, many of my AOPA members have truck driver's licences. But they've, con they've consequently gone and looked at the standards to which they now need to pass under this basic and they simply will not be able to pass it. Yet, these same people can go to the RAOs, fill out a self-cert form and, and pay a fee to a private company and have access to aviation. So we feel there's a real problem with this. We feel that there's a system that's been delivered is designed to protect the self-administration by not allowing a total liberalisation. And we've seen by way of the self-administration submission on medical reforms that they are deeply concerned that if CASA had reformed the system to a private driver's licence self-certification standard, that the financial implications may well have rendered the organisation uh, as unviable. And so we, we cannot we answer... Sorry? Which organisation? The RAOs. And so it appears that... We have a standard that's been introduced that's out of step with our international peers, does not reflect the risk that's been accepted by both the self-administrations, being the RAOs and also the gliding fraternity. So there, there is a problem here, Senators. OK, just, just a couple more from me. Um, so you've been, you've been on, on this, this mission since 2016, so I suspect you have a pretty good idea. We, we, we don't have you know, the ability to bring you back immediately after CASA to hear your response. So tell me what you think they're going to tell us and tell us what, why they're incorrect. Well, I imagine CASA will put forward that they've based their decisions on the assessment of risk. And if the Civil Aviation Safety Authority is adhering to its regulatory philosophy, then those risks will have generated a safety case and they'll be using that to base their decisions. Yet interestingly, Senators, uh, we've been requesting this safety case or this risk assessment so that we can have it peer reviewed and it has not been forthcoming. We have not seen any documentation published 
by the Civil Aviation Safety Authority in this country that justifies the decision it made. However, the United Kingdom undertook a 10-year study into medical incapacitation in pilots. And that 10-year study resulted in a determination that the risk of incapacitation was so low that it was impossible to calculate. And it was one of the fundamental underlying supports for the reform of the UK system, was the fact that they had come to the clear realisation via a medical study that the risk was low. Now, if there's been a risk assessment or a study completed in Australia, we would love to see it. And Our association would love to review it. You've written to Cancer, sorry. Sir. Yes, I have. Could you provide us with copies More of those letters to too, and particularly the dates and, and any responses? More than happy to. Again, without taking the Senator's time, you know, th this, is, this is where you're going to fall into a trap <coughs> when CASA come along. You're telling us that you've got an apple here and an apple here, identical aircraft, identical pilot, identical circumstances that they're flying in. These are under one licensing regime and these are under another. Complete, completely opposite whilst being completely identical. Is that, so, so as I don't misunderstand, that's what you're telling For us. total clarity, Senator, we are asking for the apples to be made identical. That's right. Well, you need to be careful that you don't end up with that terrible joke from my childhood about, please make both my arms the same. You might end up with what they've got. <laughs> Go on, uh, Senator. Um, I've lost my train of thought now. Um, so can you just talk us through briefly um, the, the, the changes that have occurred in the US and the UK, and do they achieve the kind of regime yeah, yeah. that you just talked well, about with the chair, that uh, everyone does fall under the same set of rules, and I assume they are graduated in some sense, so as you get into larger aircraft, yes, as right. you get into carrying more than one passenger, things do become more more yep. complex and the requirements are greater. So can you talk us briefly through how, how the US and the UK system have dealt with this different to the Australian environment? Yep. Well, firstly, Senator, I think the first statement that we should make in reflection of this is that both the UK and the US aviation regulatory system is a unified single system, meaning that there are no self-administrations. Okay. There are no privatised subsections of its uh, roles, duties and responsibilities. They produce a framework. That regulatory safety framework is used by all participants and everybody understands the rules that they are to adhere to. The difference principally here in Australia is that over the past 25, 30 years, uh, the Civil Aviation Safety Authority has promoted the ideal of creating sectors that effectively are becoming privatised monopolies in <coughs> themselves. If you are a pilot in Australia today, and you would like to fly a glider, a light sport recreational aircraft, a warbird, a certified general aviation aircraft, uh, and a gyrocopter, you have to be a paid up financial member of five different organisations effectively. And that's a bizarre situation. I don't believe anywhere else in the world this is being replicated. And as a consequence of this sector privatisation, and that is exactly what is going on here, we're, we are seeing the slow but determined privatisation of the, of the uh, sector regulation within the industry. Uh, and I'm sure I could have a two hour debate with the senators here on whether that's actually in the remit of CASA to be doing that. But as a consequence of doing this, we are now pitching the sectors in competition to one another on a bloodthirsty level. Each of these organisations are doing exactly what they should be doing. And that is they are strengthening their competitive advantages and they are competing within the aviation ecosystem or economy for larger slices of the pie. Uh, and we are uh, right now seeing this play out in terms of the way in which there's the renegotiation, Peter, of the uh, ASAC funding, where now we have real competition in the space that's resulting in real uh, feuds over how these organisations should receive their CASA funding. Is this good for the long-term aviation economy and ecosystem? Certainly it is not. And I know it's a difficult conversation and it's a difficult subject and it, it attracts the ire of the self-administrations to say this. But what's happening is we are losing the perspective on the national interest in exchange for the perspective of self-interest. Uh, and as we move further and further down that road, we're going to see further division within the industry. In relation to the medical reform process, the UK and the US both moved towards a private driver's licence standard. Both the US and the UK recognise that the higher standards of medical certification 
were a barrier to entry. And the costs involved in processing through those medicals were becoming higher and higher. The UK and the US have both put um, financial estimates as to what those costs were, and I'm happy to take it on notice, Senators, and provide all of that information, along with providing a detailed breakdown of the comparison of the medical certification privileges. But the essential central ingredient in this is that it is based on a private driver's licence standard, and there's a reason for it. They're private pilots. We have a bizarre situation in Australia where CASA are promoting the differentiation of private and recreational. Can anyone explain this? What's the difference between a private pilot and a recreational pilot? Yeah. There's no difference. They're exactly the same. Both yeah. pilots fly on the weekend. Both pilots fly uh, for no hire or reward. Both pilots are out there enjoying aviation as a hobby and a pursuit. But for some reason, we're now separating recreational from private and we're creating real differential uh, a real differential in the medical certification so, standard. So where would station owners and, and private, farmers for private. private? Right. And they're, they're, unfortunately, yeah. Senators, this, this is a section of the community that's really feeling it now. I've got so many station owners that will phone up and say, Ben, I've got to sell that GA aeroplane because I just can't pass the medical anymore. And as my colleagues from the AMROBA will attest, this is impacting our maintenance engineering fraternity. We are watching the capability and sustainability of our general aviation maintenance community decline and decline rapidly. Because people mm. are selling general aviation aircraft, not because they don't want them, not because they're not practical, not because they're not useful, simply because they can't maintain a CASA medical. Mr. Mm. Mr. Talbot, sorry, just lastly from me, um, just Mr. You Talbot, can you just Patrick, talk us yeah. through that issue, uh, the impact on your members, um, uh, what's happening to the I guess the, the, the businesses that support the general aviation sector? Well, I think um, the uh, AMROVA members are seeing, uh, I guess, a, an exodus of, um, of you know, recreational and private pilots, particularly from the, uh, from the sector. Um, there's been a few other considerations, I think, in recent years. If you owned a Cessna, you know, we had the SIDS program, um, which which meant that a lot of aircraft had to have um, significant maintenance um, done to them. So quite a few aircraft had gone at that point. Um, but yeah, I sort of think we are we are seeing a decline in um, in the use of general aviation aircraft. Oh, sorry, no. Yeah, no, we'll have to go to Senator yep. Patrick. Senator Patrick. Yeah, look, I just want to get away from uh, different classes of, 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 of people, whether they're private or their recreational uh, to, to the sort of root analysis of this. So you heard the evidence I took from the previous witnesses where it was explained that perhaps a, a greater medical standard is required because the, the, um, a private pilot is flying a more complex aircraft or more complex uh, operations because they go and perhaps go into controlled airspace. Um, I, I would have thought that training would have, in some sense, uh, uh, counted the stress level because you've, you've, there, there's more training Absolutely. involved in that. Is it, is that. Would you share that view? Absolutely. I, I think you hit the nail right on the head and that's, uh, you, you gave the, the, certainly the Warbirds guys and the Parachute guys the perfect opportunity to speak to that training. Uh, but if I could uh, answer that same question, you're absolutely, it's all training. I mean, you're either fit to fly or you're not fit to fly. It's a black and white issue. You know, so, so, and and the, uh, the additional information that Mr King gave, that each pilot is required to, to make that assessment on the day they go flying, whether they are fit, we all have to do that under the law. It doesn't matter what our medical uh, classification is. Mm -hmm. the, the, the crux of the problem here is, as a private and or recreational driver, pilot, why have we got a different medical standard? If self-certifying medical declaration is is safe and and signed off as safe by CASA, then that medical class is fit for everybody who is operating a private recreational flight, regardless of their registration mark on their aeroplane or the weight of their aeroplane. And I, I bring in the weight because most recently. RAOs have applied for 1,500 kilos increase in weight, which will take in most of 
the general aviation fleet used for private recreational flight. So around 8,000 kilos, is that right? No, no. no 1,500 1, 1, kilos. Extra? No, a di- a total. Total. To- total. total. Okay. And, uh, and CASA has come out and basically made some statements that they're thinking about 760 kilos as a halfway measure, and the statement was made publicly that we'll have a look at that, and if they achieve safety at that level of 760 kilos, we'll look at 1,500 kilos. Now, the reason I'm talking about this is because it's all about, as you said, Senator, training. Weight and registration mark has nothing to do with medical. Medical is either fit to fly or not fit to fly. So why do we have differing standards? And I would have gone, uh, perhaps asked the question, uh, I know, Mr Morgan, you might have said this uh, flippantly, but I would have thought the airspace in the United States and in the UK is in fact different to Australia in terms of congestion and in terms of uh, much harsher weather conditions. I've never had to sit on a, on a runway in Australia and have de-icing occurring, so... Senator, you're absolutely correct. So you You've nailed that one. The, <laughs> they do face far more challenging uh, uh, weather conditions than we do here in Australia, which just further amplifies uh, the disparity in the system that we have. And I think just to add a little bit to, uh, to what um, uh, Mr White is saying, uh, I heard the comment from uh, the RAO's uh, chair, or um, acting, chair. acting chair, sorry, uh, that correction, it was from Spencer Ferrier, that the RAO system has been set up to deal with the simpler, simpler aircraft. Mm. Um, and I think that, that we, we've got to be careful in, in looking at that statement and putting way t- uh, too much of a stamp on it. And that is these aircraft today, when, when the RAOs, go back in time, for, you know, 10, 15 years ago, the RAOs were flying aeroplanes with pretty much rag and tube ultralights. A great number of aeroplanes with chainsaw motors on them virtually. These things were pretty experimental, pretty wild, wild west type of aeroplanes. Right, but the, right the type problem. of aircraft the type of aircraft that the RAOs are flying today are for all intent and purpose a general aviation aircraft. So much so that a significant number of these types are now being used by flight training organisations nationwide. And so are we in fact, uh, is CASA in fact providing liberalisation for simplified aircraft or are we now providing liberalisation for a pseudo general aviation? And I'm often confused when I look at the general aviation economy now and I see I go to a flight school and I see a flight school buying up a whole bunch of RAO's aircraft um, and I say to them, why are you putting RAO's aeroplanes online here with a flight school? And they say, it's pretty simple. Um, The students don't have to go through half the turmoil they have to go through with CASA. We don't have to go through half the turmoil we go through with maintaining it because we can obtain our own maintenance approvals. We can put our own people through a simplified RAO's maintenance course and we can own and maintain the aircraft. Uh, They're cheaper to run. And so there's a very good reason as to why we're seeing proliferation in this, in this space. We're seeing proliferation and we're seeing rapid growth in RLs because it's a sad indictment of the failure of CASA to actually reform our system. And if CASA had taken a centralised reform approach to our overall regulatory framework and provided universal reform in terms of improving the system, that we would have seen general aviation flight schools bringing these aircraft in and we would have had overall growth. But instead, we've got this bizarre situation where we're seeing growth in an environment that can really only be categorised as a state-sponsored monopoly. And it is a state-sponsored monopoly because it can't exist without the special conditions and alleviances that CASA provided, whether it be through supplemental funding, whether it be through uh, reformed medical standards, the allowance to maintain your own aeroplanes. It doesn't matter which way we look at this. This thing is sponsored <coughs> by CASA. Now, we're not asking for it to be removed. What we're asking for is we're asking for our National Aviation Safety Regulator to do the job of providing the national general aviation economy with a fair, equitable and balanced regulatory environment so that we all have opportunity. OK, I just want to go to... a. a um you said you said you haven't seen any any um, uh, safety case, but I, I do have an FOI that I um, sought that uh, basically describes the decision that has been made in respect to the policy. Uh, you've probably seen that document, Mr. Morgan, haven't you? Uh, are you referring to the NAUS report? No, no. There's an FOI. Oh. I've got an FOI here, which I'm happy to table. Um, 
uh, it's been released to me under, FO, in, under Freedom of Information uh, and describes the, uh, a decision to, uh, in respect of aviation med medical certification policy uh, and actually makes the point, it's, a, it's got a date of 22 November 2017 and it makes the point that they are actually going to conduct a more detailed review over the next 18 to 24 months. Uh, I just have you seen that document? Oh, I have seen it, but there's a couple yep. of comments I'd like to make in relation to that. Sure. Uh, Firstly, can I table that, please? Well, you need to get copies circulated to yeah, the Senate, right. doesn't have them consent, but uh, so, without there be any difficulty. Um, yeah, the, the front two pages really just show that it's an FOI from me, so yeah, just, just really the, the, the documents that were released on the FOI. Thank you. I'll just say, that's been released to me on the FOI. Sorry, you wanted to make some comments about it? Yeah, sure. Thank you, Senator. Um, three specific points in relation to this is, number one, uh, between the date that AOPA and our AGAA partners made their submissions on the medical uh, discussion paper, which I believe was 31st of March, if my memory serves me correctly, um, between 31st of March and approximately November, December of 2017, um, at no time did the Civil Aviation Safety Authority uh, engage with our organisations or any of the representative bodies uh, at this table about its intentions or plans around its final decision with respect to medical reform. But did it not uh, call for submissions and take submissions? It did call for submissions, and this is an interesting area, Senator, I'm really glad that you've brought it up, because it strikes at the heart of a debate which is going at the moment as to whether there is due consultation taking place. Now, consultation is a word that's thrown around a great deal in the aviation industry by CASA. Uh, it throws around the statement that it consults with industry and therefore the decisions that, it's make, that it makes are in fact deemed to be collaborative when in fact they are not. And the reason I say this is uh, the medical reform process was a very clear example of the fact that we were asked for an opinion, we gave an opinion, but from the date we gave an opinion, no further correspondence was really entered between the parties on the issue. Now, during that period in which no consultation was taking place, the AOPA actually wrote to CASA uh, on several occasions and, and made clear that we were seeking the opportunity to participate in the Civil Aviation Safety Authority's ASAP, or Aviation Safety Advisory Panel. And in fact, I got a letter back on July 2017 um, from CASA, and it states, um, I refer to your letter of 7th of July, addressed to Mr. Carmody, Chief, Chief Executive Chief. and Director of Aviation Safety, in relation to the establishment of the ASAP. One of the key challenges we faced in establishing the new consultation arrangements was to find a group of individuals that was sufficiently representative of our diverse industry, while small enough to allow us to start having much more constructive discussions. And what goes on to basically say that, you know, whilst we thank you for uh, asking us if you can join this ASAP, thanks but no thanks. And in fact, it's, it's been CASA's maintained position since the ASAP was formed and structured that AOPA simply can't participate. And that's quite a bizarre situation, Senators, considering that we represent now 4,000 aircraft owners and pilots in the industry. So we're roughly half the number of registered aircraft in pilot numbers. Um, there's still quite a number of pilots out there, but we're by no means a small association. We've been around since 1949. Uh, uh, so next year, I think it's our 70th birthday, and we've been involved in a considerable amount of debate. But we are prevented, Ooh. make no illusions, we are prevented from sitting on this ASAP panel. And I can only assume that we're being prevented from sitting on the panel because I've been outspoken. And I have uh, voiced my clear opinions and our association's clear opinions with respect to what we see as bad regulation and poor policy. Uh, and so our continued approaches to CASA to say we would like to be involved in this process has been met with lovely thanks, but no thanks. Uh, and so by November, the Civil Aviation Safety Authority put a proposal forward to its ASAP panel and asked its ASAP panel to effectively endorse CASA's position on medical reform, which was to deny the industry a self-certification medical standard. And so if you look at the, what makes up that ASAP panel, Senators, you know, you've got CASA asking Qantas what its opinions are on private pilot medical reform. CASA's asking Virgin, the Australian Airports Association, 
asking the Recreational Aviation Australia for its opinion, but not actually seeking the opinion of the very people that they're there proposing to change the regulations about. So consultation, from our perspective, is a very frustrating word. It's a word that upsets us greatly because we absolutely know there is no equity in this consultation framework and we would love that to change. We have always maintained to CASA that we want to play a constructive role, but we are being denied that opportunity because we do not agree. And I guess in, in uh, summary is if CASA want to create a cheerleader squad, they're welcome to do so, but the problem is they're missing out on understanding the balance to these challenges. So we're not seeking to be involved to grandstand, we're not seeking to be involved uh, to create trouble. We're seeking to represent the interests of our members, which at this point in time on medical concerns, their rights are being denied. So we think it's a very important issue and it's something we really should be involved in. So can I, sorry, sorry on that, if I can please, Senator Patrick, Chair. So if I'm a, a member of yours and then I'm going to get told I have to, I can't pass, I'm not fit enough, but I can go over to RAI Oz, yep. why would I stay a member of yours? Um, it's a, well, it's a great question. Um, I believe that the vast majority of our members are supporting us, and Senator, I'm very pleased to report that our membership's been growing consistently now for two and a bit years. I think we're doing a good job these days. Uh, but people are supporting AOPA because we are standing up on these issues. The private pilot community in this country generally are feeling like their rights are being taken away from them, and they are being forced out of the government regulated uh, arena and being put into the hands of a private company. Now, I know we could probably go out there and ask for the opinions of 4,000 members. As someone that exists within this system myself, I can, I can speak passionately to the fact that I do not want to see my medical become the private business intellectual property of a monopoly provider. We have all seen the impacts of airport privatisation on our industry. Airport privatisation has virtually destroyed our general aviation business economy through rapid, uncontrolled price increases and rises. And one of the things that frightens me under this process of self-administration in Part 149 is there's been a race to get it done. And in the process of racing to get it done, there appears to be absolutely no consideration being given to how this will impact on aircraft owners and pilots. What protections are being discussed or put in place to stop unconscionable price rises? What protections are being afforded to those that will become entirely dependent on a private company to be able to continue to access aviation? Do, does that, just out of curiosity, because they're self-assessed um, or self-regulated, I presume they're audited from time to time by CASA? Uh, I understand that that may be the case. Um, I'm not sure all, if any of that information all, is made public. All, all the SAOs are audited okay. uh, from time to time. Thank you. It's probably more of a question for, for, for CASA, actually. But, Senator, I would, I would also yeah. raise the following concern, and that is we can write to CASA, um, sometimes whether they choose to respond to us uh, or whether they take their time in doing it, and that's obviously a concern. Uh, but if we write to the RAOs and we want to seek information with respect to rights and access, they're under no obligation to reply as a private company. Mm. And so, again, uh, there are things here that haven't been considered and haven't been given due thought, and if we allow it to go uncontrolled, then I think we're looking at airport privatisations mark two, but this time it'll be our right of access to, to fly. Well, okay. Senator, I'm going to come to, back to Senator Stirl and then for Senator Brockman just to have one or two minutes to tidy up on the evidence. Thank, thanks, Chair. Just quickly, so Mr Morgan, with the frustration, and everyone at the table, with your frustration, this process, trying to consult with CAS, has been going on for 18 months, is that right? About that, uh, with medical reform, Senator? Yeah, the medical yeah, it's activity. been going on since December 16. December 16. Have you written, have you gone above CAS's head and written to any of the ministers? Oh, look, Senator, I'm well known for it. Um, <laughs> oh, I absolutely okay. have written to the minister and is equally disappointed with the minister as we are with CASA at this point in time. And, uh, you know, I've, I've been thinking about this particular issue for the last week leading up to this uh, hearing today, and that is we are supposed to be living in a democracy. It's an awfully disappointing realisation that when you take on a role such as what I have with AOPA, uh, you kind of come into it thinking it's going to be okay. We're going to write to our minister, we're going to have meetings with our minister, we're going to discuss the needs and aspirations of our community, and we're going to get things changed so that we can take advantage of opportunity. But when you sit with a minister, and the minister shows absolutely no interest and no real commitment to actually change anything, uh, the reality starts to sink in, and that is, it's not the minister who appears to be calling the shots, it's the regulator. And so we're in this bizarre situation that we can't effectively engage with our regulator. 
Our minister's not showing an appetite to want to sink his teeth in and get going. And we decided to test that, Senator. We brought together 34 associations and 100 individuals from the leadership of those organisations and brought them to Wagga and held a general aviation industry summit. And it was reported, as, it reported by the media as one of the largest events of its kind. And I really, uh, I do actually commend our partners in doing it because it demonstrated that our industry can work together and genuinely wants to stand shoulder to shoulder to create opportunity. But even in the, the, the aftermath of creating such a positive event that produced a powerful set of recommendations to the, to the government, it's fallen on deaf ears. Little to nothing has been done. Uh, and so I, I do despair, Senator. I despair not just for AOPA, I despair for the thousands of pilots and the hardworking men and women of every aviation business in this country that their voice truly is unheard. And it seems to me that un until there's a real circuit breaker, whether it be a powerful inquiry, a royal commission, a judicial inquiry, whatever that may be, until there is something that truly exposes the fact that we have a regulator that is not genuinely consulting, not collaboratively working towards the future, I really don't know what the outcome will be. Can I throw this one, please, Chair, just quickly? And, and it's well known in this nation that we've got a shortage, a pilot shortage. So by not having the level playing field that we've got now through the medical certificates, would that be an impost on attracting young people into the aviation industry or not? Look, when you complicate anything, it becomes a hurdle. And today what youth are faced with is they come into the aviation system being told, come and get an RAOS RPC, start here. It's cheap. They get that RPC, but they still have to jump into the CASA system. But now what we've got is a CASA, CASA system which is becoming incredibly expensive. And the reason the CASA system is becoming expensive is we've been wholesale gutting general aviation to pour it yeah. into recreational. Yeah. And that's because... Oh, sorry, Chair. Go on. And I know it's going to lead on to because we've got the table supplied to us, the difference between the cost of training and so getting a licence. So if you just tidy up on that, we'll go to Senator Brockman. OK. Then. And just share with us very quickly, if you can, Mr Morgan, and anyone else, you've provided... I think you provided us with that. Who provides no, that? No, it was on the website. Oh, it was on the website. Our diligent secretariat has found... And I'll just quickly say that if you want to... Oz Ozflyer. Oz yep. And it talks about Ozflyer. Go through them because we can get it cheaper... You know, uh, we can go to the United States and there's some recognition you come yep. back, do a little bit more testing. But just for example there, Chair, for a private pilot licence in the US, this is in US dollars, you can get it for 9500 in one and a half to two months. The Australian qu equivalent in US dollars is $20,000 yep. and three to six months. So there is this Oz... What's it called? Oz thing, whatever. Ozflyer. Ozflyer. Yep. So it's encouraged. Let's go. We'll go to the US, get trained, come back, and then we'll Absolutely, work Senator. our way around it's the system so sad. we don't have to do the training here in Australia. So, Senator, Good just very quickly, that. my response to that is for nearly 30 years, the Australian aviation industry has been calling on the Civil Aviation Safety Authority to adopt the US regulatory framework. It's almost like a broken record. For years, decades, 30 years, think about this, 30 years there has been a consistent message, adopt the US regulatory framework. Yet for 30 years we continue to be told by our regulator, you can't do that. They've put up every obstacle, every reason, every excuse known to mankind as to why they can't do it. So the failure of the general aviation industry sits squarely on their shoulders because they had the opportunity 30 years ago to actually get with it and to get that US system going, but have refused to do so. And now we're in a situation where Australia is wholly uncompetitive on the global yeah. stage. Yeah. And given the fact that the US currency advantage to the Australian, you would think we would have a thriving flight training industry right now and a thriving private pilot economy, but we do not. No, I want to share these, sorry, Mr. Morgan, I share these figures with the Senate when it goes through, this is from the website, private pilot licence instrument rating, commercial pilot, multi-engine and flight instructor. Should you do it in the US, it's going to take you six to eight months and it's going to cost you 33500 US dollars. Should you do it in Australia, it'll take 15 to 24 months and in US dollars, it's 85 thousand dollars, fifty odd thousand dollars. And, and Senator, more. one but of the what's that one site, of the, uh, Senator, just so it's, it's the Senator website. Is. It's called Oz Flyer. Um, I'll get it for you. Sorry, Mr. Morgan. Just yeah, no, Senator, it's fine. Aussie Flyer. I've lost it. Do we have any thing to? Is it, if you people? Got Aussie Flyer website. If you O Z I F L Y. Yeah, so I shouldn't say. Has anyone got a body of 
the cell detective in me. Has anyone got a body of material that underpins that? I mean, I'm... No, I don't. I, I take Senator, everything off the no, internet with I'm a I'm more a than happy to take on notice and we'll compile... I, I've got a very similar chance to this. I'm happy to compile an international cross comparison to show you where it all stands. With, with, it, with it referenced particularly uh, so that we can test any aspect of it. I'm happy to do so, Senator. A, a, I'll, I'll, I'll wind up, Chell. I'll just say this you. is Uber with wings. Uber with wings. Did you like that? Senator, I think what's very important to understand about the flight training costs in the United States is one of the biggest fundamental differences, well, actually two huge fundamental differences, but one of the largest contributing there is the fact that 75% roughly of all flight training in the United States is conducted by independent flight instructors. Now, we've taken this proposal to CASA, and this proposal fell on deaf ears. We used to have independent flight instructors uh, within our system up to about 89. That provision was removed, and if you have plot it all out, you'll see that the cost of flight training increases as you force people into structured fixed based training environments because they mm. carry greater overheads. Now CASA will tell you, you can do independent flight instruction under the current system and you are right, you can technically do that, but you cannot do it to the level of cost efficiency that you can do it under the US system. And in fact if I can just go back to the last meeting I had with CASA face to face on this issue, uh, we had a representative uh, from the United States who is one of our directors, Mr Mike Smith, who's a former Deputy Director of Aviation Safety for CASA, I think he knows something about the job and he knows something about our industry, who runs a flight training and maintenance organisation in the United States. And Mike Smith made it abundantly clear to the representatives that in the United States an individual can start a flight training organisation and they can also start a maintenance organisation and they can also start a charter organisation with a bare minimum, of bare minimum of documentation and a bare minimum of cost. And what we're talking about, Senators, mm. is spending maybe $5,000 to get a multiple set of approval set up. Yet in Australia, I am yet to meet an operator who has been able to achieve the successful start-up of a flight training maintenance or charter operation without spending bucket loads of cash. Okay. So there is a problem. The two systems are very different and the system we've got is the donkey and the system they've got in the United States is the Ferrari, and I know which one I would prefer to be driving. And just quickly, oh, Chair, can I just quote, please, sorry, can yeah. I just quote on their website, this is Oz Flyer, yep. only in WIFA, which is where they are, the price includes accommodation and a vehicle. This is a significant financial advantage when dealing with long periods of time. You will not find an option like this in Australia, and it will save you a fortune. Okay, okay. right. Just, just really quickly, Rock. and sorry. as you've taken that on notice, and you can tell me that CASA has this information, but um, can you also provide us with comparative safety data? Obviously, the US general aviation sector is a lot bigger, um, so I don't know if somebody's done a comparison that says number of pilot hours versus yeah, Senator, accidents. We, we, we can obtain that data. We have a huge amount of support through the international AOPA, and of course, international AOPA is the largest global general aviation advocate, so we'd be happy to do so. So can we have a, a, a cost comparison, but also a safety comparison? Uh, I, I can do my best with that, Senator. We might have to liaise a little. <laughs> okay. Let's well, see what you can do. I, I don't, you know, I don't expect you to go to, to the ends of the earth on that one. And just really quickly, um, and I'm happy for you to take this on notice if it requires a long answer. But just going back to to uh, Senator Stirl's question, a couple of questions ago, um, we've got Qantas going uh, to setting up flight training academies. Has the general aviation sector declined, decline led to uh, a, a, an exacerbation of that issue of not enough pilots? That the pathway of a young pilot through the GA sector to commercial pilot has that fallen away? Which is why now the larger airlines are having to look at much more at the. Flight okay, training well, academies? Senator, <laughs> a very simple answer is yes, but I, I just want to extend on a little bit. Um, the general aviation flight training community in Australia has had to undertake a number of fundamental changes over the last couple of years, um, transitioning out of the old approval system into the new 141-142. And these new approval regimes which were introduced by CASA have added enormous costs to the operation of those schools. And as a consequence of that, you've actually got a number of schools that have decided just to pack up and exit. Um, what's actually happening in Australia is a significant number of our schools are being sold to Chinese interests. Uh, there was a, a fairly large school at Bankstown Airport which in fact belonged to the president of AOPA, Aminta Hennessy. She's just sold out her flight training operation and it's gone to a consortium 
uh, that are now, I think there's five Chinese airlines involved in that consortium and their training. Uh, the growth we're seeing now in flight training is all to do with Chinese market training. It is not to do with Australian local training. And the airlines are now having to step into this space because the small mum and dad operations, which were for many decades very successful at training some of our uh, most accomplished pilots, have been driven out of business. Now, CASA will tell you that they haven't. CASA will tell you, no, 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 no. They were market forces, economic market forces that led to the demise of those businesses. But if you get those business uh, persons in a room and you sit with them, they are very clear and unambiguous as to why they are no longer in the general aviation industry. And again, I, I, I believe just in maybe some closing remarks here, there is a real problem in our general aviation industry, a massive problem. And that problem is the way in which our safety regulator is regulating our business community and our users. And there needs to be a deep and serious inquiry into the way in which this regulator has behaved. I all too often in my role receive numerous letters and correspondence across my desk of examples of behaviour that frankly leave you aghast. A regulator that demonstrates that it will go to extreme lengths, extreme lengths to litigate. I've got examples of private pilots who have performed nothing more than a misdemeanour, yeah. a traffic infringement effectively, but have virtually lost their houses trying to defend the right to maintain their private pilot licence. Yeah. Now something is catastrophically wrong. How many millions of dollars are we spending pursuing people in a punitive fashion. Now, I understand right. it's not the direct the, Mr. The direct Morgan, I'm going, to, I'm going to have to, uh, I'm sorry, but I'm going to have to wind it up there because CASA deserves their, their time here to respond to some of this stuff. Can you send it up? But if you've, got, if, if you've got evidence of what you've just spoken about, you need to particularise it carefully. You need to underpin it with the physical We're evidence and reference it and get it to the committee. I mean, Happy to provide that. Your, your view is valuable, but um, evidence supporting a statement is even more valuable. And oftentimes I find in our world that, and I'm not suggesting this is the case with you, that it just evaporates sometimes. People's views uh, sure. have formed a view and it's, uh, and it's not a fair view. So thank you, uh, gentlemen, for your...